This morning, David talked about interfaces and Javadoc. And I'm going to give an interface example. And uh, I think I'm going to start with that. And Javadoc is where sailors go for their caffeine fix, right? Uh, OK. Yesterday, yesterday, we did the file system example which we were hoping to have up on the website by now, but uh, technical problems intervened and uh, unfree software that we couldn't look at the source code and figure out why it wasn't working. So, yeah. Uh, it, has nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with whether it's commercial. It has to do with the fact that we don't have the source code. It's sort of like whether you call it abortion rights or Uh, So with with any luck, it'll be up tonight. So we we were left yesterday with the problem that we had various subclasses of file that had an execute method. And some of them were binary files, such as Java class file, or just the ordinary executable file. And some of them, such as shell scripts, are text files. So some of each of those are executable, but not all text files are executable. Not all binary files are executable. In in some languages, you can have a class that inherits from two different classes. So the shell script class would inherit both from text file and from executable. And other ones would inherit both from binary and from executable. And that's really neat when it works, but it has a lot of pitfalls. And the designers of Java decided not to go that route. Instead, there's another route which in some cases works out really well. And this is one of the cases that happens to work out well, just by coincidence. And uh, so we had various uh, various file with execute methods, and they all work by themselves, but up until now, we had no way of saying, I want to get a file that's executable, or I want to test if a particular file is executable. But it could be any one of these myriad of subclasses that are executable. For example, if you have a uh, graphical directory displayer, and you want somebody to be able to click on a file in order to run it, so you want to call the run method or the execute method on it. And if it turns out not to be executable, then uh, then you get an error at runtime. Oh, actually, you may get a compile time depending on which way you wrote your program. But you get an error some, at some point. So what we can do is. Define an interface executable. And you'll find that lots of interfaces end in a bowl. So here's our executable interface, and it specifies one method, execute. And it doesn't do anything, because it's an interface rather than an instant, rather than a class. You could have something like this that was an abstract class, where the definition would look pretty much the same. You'd have a definition of a method with no implementation. The difference is that since you can only inherit from one class, 
but you can have as many interfaces, you can implement as many interfaces as you want to if this is going to be something that's going to be applied to a bunch of different classes scattered around, then you want to make it an interface. So we put up here And by the way, the file system.java code that is going to be on the website includes the executable interface already. So we say this, uh, for example, Java class file and shell script. Etc. And then somewhere else, such as in our graphical directory manipulator, we can say and then later on we can say xfile.execute, and it'll find the execute method on the appropriate um, class, whatever class this actually happens to be on. Just like with subclass polymorphism, uh, the syntax and the way it works are basically the same. And we, we might have had something in between where we had something like X file equals actually this is going to be X file equals file system dot find file by name. And actually if we try to do this, uh, the compiler will complain because this is a file and this is an executable, so we would have to cast it. That says executable in parentheses. And this will compile fine, but if, uh, if it turns out that when you find the file that it's not an executable file, then you'll get a class cast exception, which you'll learn about at some point. Basically what it means is your program will die. Um, when you try to execute uh, this thing, you're trying to cast something that isn't an executable into an executable variable. I assume there's a way to test for that in runtime. Yeah, there is. Okay, uh, now we have a little bit of a target for questions, either about this example or about other aspects of interfaces. Do you have to write the executable method? Uh, executable isn't a method. Execute is a method. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Each um, each class that actually implements executable uh, has to have a non-abstract method execute. Uh, for example, the various file class has an execute method. It doesn't do anything, but it does have the method. Shell script and Java class would have su substantial methods. Um, you can have sub-interface. Uh, they, they really work like classes in that you can have a sub-interface. So, Suppose we had some subclass that was executables that took command line arguments. That, or so you can make a sub-interface. Interface executables that take command line arguments extends executable and put another, uh, another method uh, execute that took an array of strings, just as a Java main takes an array of strings. And uh, then you could have some of these classes might uh, implement 
executable that takes command line arguments. And in that case, they would need to have two methods, one that implemented the no arguments execute and another that implemented the execute with the command line. So this would be a method? There would be a method. Uh, yeah, you'd have void. Um, yeah, actually, it has to be public because it's public in the interface. So the, this second example would, and then that would have implementation. So the second example would necessarily be present only in the ones that it, uh, implemented the subclass executable with arguments. If you put it into, you could put it into, um, and this is something to be careful about when you're writing programs, you can put an execute method, either or both of these, into a class that doesn't implement executable. And they'll work if you call them. The problem is that when you get down here, it won't work because unless you specifically say that it implements executable, the compiler and the runtime won't know it just because they happen to have those methods doesn't mean that they implement it. So if they implement both of these, you need to be careful about saying uh, which, which one it implements. Just need a little bit of time to take it in. Somewhere, yeah. is execute defined to do something? Uh, in these classes, it's defined to actually do something. In the various file class, it's defined to do nothing. So there, there is, in this class, there actually is an implementation. Um, it just doesn't do anything. So it's important to note, especially when you're looking at the black, you're not going to see this very often in real code, but you're going to see it a lot in Blackboard code where it doesn't really matter what the method does, just putting up the braces to indicate that there needs to be some implementation there. But there are cases where, uh, where you would have a method that really doesn't do anything. For, uh, for example, if you have a class of people and you have a method get hit by bullet and you have a subclass that's Superman, then the get hit by bullet method wouldn't do anything. It would override the ordinary people uh, method and just not do anything. I don't understand why you would implement executable in that file if the execute method's not going to do anything. Well, um, in, in these two, uh, I was just putting this up to show what the structure looks like. The, any of the ones that you would actually want to implement, in this case with executable, actually would have code in there. So an interface, let me just back up for a second. An interface executable could have multiple methods, public methods in it. Right. So that if you wanted to implement various files executable, you would have to put a void for the one you didn't want. Uh, void void return refers to the return value. The empty braces refer to the fact that it doesn't do anything. <laughs> but you're right that uh, if you have a bunch of methods here, you have to implement all of them in your class in order for it to fully implement um, the method. Although it, what you could end up doing in in some cases, if you only implement some of them, then you end up with an abstract class. Uh, just as if you don't implement all the methods, um, if, if you can define an abstract class that doesn't that has methods that aren't implemented and subclasses that don't implement all of them, and you still have to define those as abstract methods, don't you? Uh, you just define the class as abstract and leave those methods blank. I'm not sure about that particular case. You definitely have to define the class as abstract. But I know that with a subclass, as contrasted with an interface, you don't have to 
do it. So you might luck out with the interface. You might not. I know what I would do. Try to leave them out and see if it compiles. Any other questions here about interfaces? OK, I'm going to leave this up for a while. And there might be some questions later. I just have a hunch. Good. One question. If, if your class implements an interface, does that get inherited down to all of its subclasses? Yes. And the method that the method that implements it gets inherited down, and the subclasses can override it. Okay. Where is the interface written? Is it written like a class file in its own file, or is it where do you like write it and save it? <laughs> it's ju it's just like a class in that regard. I do It's a .dot Java file. Yeah, it's it's either its own or part of a .dot Java file. Yeah. Yeah, you right, you have to compile it. It's got to be its own file. So you'd have yeah. an executable.java with just that little mm -hmm. piece of thing in it. Mm -hmm. Just that little piece of thing plus the Java doc comments. Right. <laughs> 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 May not be a whole lot of Java doc comments given that it doesn't do anything, but. Uh, it wouldn't have to be public, but it could be. It depends. It, if you only need to use that interface from within the package, then you wouldn't make it public. If it needs to be accessible to other packages, then you would make it public. What package is this one part of? Uh, by default, whatever is in your working directory is all part of one package. And at some point, maybe Dave will teach you about packages other than just whatever happens to be sitting around. <laughs> Array sort uses the comparable interface. It doesn't implement an interface. So Array sort is used to sort an array of comparable objects. And each of those objects needs to be an instance of a class that implements comparable. Hopefully, they're all instances of the same class or at least uh, hierarchically related classes that implement comparable. For example, integer and string both implement comparable, but if you tried to do an array sort on it, uh, you probably wouldn't be happy with the results. And it would compile because um, everything's comparable. And you can add things to, to the array because they're comparable. And then you end up trying to run compare to. And, and at that point, it would fail. I think there's something in the problem set about stuff like that. And for the sake of anybody who is watching the video and didn't hear what David said, it was that the java.util class, or its package, excuse me, contains lots of interfaces and things that use interfaces. And you can browse through the Java doc for that at the URL that I gave yesterday. To, to see stuff about it. Do you think you just had mini cups of <laughs> savor it? <laughs> Can you think of a couple of examples from that before Well, there, there's the comparable interface. Uh, and let's see. Not, um, there's clonable, but that. Uh, I'm not sure whether 
that, that's a weird one. Um, uh, why don't I mention it just because it's one of the few examples I can actually think of. Clonable is an interface that has no methods at all. And you might wonder why anybody would have an interface that doesn't have any methods. And the reason is that there's a method clone in the class object, which basically makes a duplicate of whatever you give it. And some classes don't want to be cloned or don't want to have their objects cloned, and some don't mind. And some might have their own way of doing it. So by default, the object class won't let you clone anything. It will only let you clone something that implements the clonable interface. So by means of the clonable interface, you can identify the classes that you want to have able to be cloned. So if we wanted to be able to clone a shell script, we would write after a shell script. Um, and I should also have written here various file. This is true for all of them. Extends either text file or binary file. So, um, so we have that extends whichever kind of file it is that it implements executable, and we could also put out here that it implements clonable. If it implements clonable and there's no method, <coughs> how does it know that it now can be cloned? Like, where is that information? There's a class called class mm -hmm. whose objects are classes. <laughs> um, and uh, so one of the um, properties of the class object, um, excuse me, I'm, gonna, I, I'm kind of losing it, and I'm going to sit down and make my life a little bit easier. Um, has nothing to do with your questions. <laughs> um, so basically what happens is that the clone method on the object class Looks at um, looks at that information, and there's special ways to get at the information. I won't get into the details, but it can basically syntactically ask, "Does this thing support clonable?" And if it does, then it goes ahead and clones it. And if it doesn't, then it throws an exception. Right. Implementing an interface is like extending a class conceptually. You're saying, "Okay, that thing has some methods defined." and I'm going to tell you how they work. Whereas using the interface is down here. We have an object whose type is the name of the interface, and we're calling a method. So here we're using the execute. Um, we're using a method in the interface. I could, you, you could say that you're using the interface. Well, uh, yeah, using the interface means calling the method up. If the methods in an interface, or like let's take your example right there, the public void execute with the string arguments. Okay. You don't have to put arguments, or do you have to, or not put arguments with the public void execute? Okay. In the uh, interface? Well, we actually had two interfaces, and I only wrote one of them up on the board. We had one interface uh, executable, which has a no argument method called execute. And then there's another interface um, executable with args extends that one and it has the public void execute so anything that Im implements only executable would only need to have this one and anything that implements executable with args would need to have both <coughs> 
job is smart enough to know that if it's passing R and D's, is it? Right. You, you can you can do that with any um, anything on the arguments. You can uh, if you look at Java.util, uh, particularly if you look at some of the constructors, such as if you look at the constructors of string or double, are good examples. You'll see that they have lots of methods with the same name that take different arguments and. From the compiler's point of view, they're essentially different methods, and it will generate a reference to the right one. So if you put various file implements, do you have to put executable and executable with args, or can you just say executable? You can just put executable with args. Right. So if you say executable with args, and you only have one of those uh, function methods implemented one version, then you'll get a compiler error. And that's because executable with args includes everything that executable has. Right. Let me ask you this: If you have the let's say you have the executable with args and you want various files to do something with that. But if it's without ours, you don't want it to do anything. Right. Then, then you would put some code in here, and you would leave that empty. You can do that, though? Yeah. Like one section blank and one yeah. section Yeah. Yeah. And basically, as long as you have the braces there, it's happy. You don't have to actually put any functional code between the braces. The presence of the, the paired braces that says, we've implemented this method, and it's not abstract anymore. Okay. So that even though the executable with args is an extension or a subclass of executable. You can have execute with args, the execute that's in there, okay, uh, do something in the regular. Right. From the compiler's point of view, they both do something. It's just that in one case, the something is, is actually just returning. Just a more general question. What, what's really the benefit of using an interface and it doesn't really do anything. So for example, if I have two classes which extend the same interface, anyway, I have to, to implement the methods in the classes, right? Right, but the... Is it like maybe the, 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 or the yeah, I uh, like the example down here. We have X file is an executable, and we don't know if it's a shell script or a Java class file or a various file, but we know that it's executable. And so we can call the execute method on it. So, so the, the main benefit or the sole benefit is just to be able to, to, to handle different objects in the same way? Or? Uh, well, other than the weird example with uh, the clonable interface, where the interface is basically just uses a me mechanism to flag the class, uh, then I think. I think that's the primary benefit, is to be able to use polymorphism. If you're wondering about things with interfaces, and you just sort of think of them as abstract classes that you're allowed to have as many of as you want, <coughs> then, then you usually end up with the right answers, assuming that you understand how abstract classes and inheritance work to begin with. You can't have variables in an interface. Okay, let's move on. Let's try moving on to Java Doc. Uh, I don't want to get into any of the syntax thing, syntax details on Java Doc. Uh, and it's pretty easy to look them up. If there's any conceptual, and, and, and as you get to do it, you, I'm, I'm sure it will become pretty much second nature. Uh, but if there's any conceptual things about Java Doc, you know, hows, uh, you know, whys or whatever, um, then it would be good to hear those kinds of questions. <coughs> 
a bunch of classes, or you can run it on a package that's got about 40 command line arguments that let you tell it what you want. And it creates lots of HTML files. Uh, it'll create one for each class and some header ones and maybe some other ones I'm not real sure about, which means that because of the way in which our class bulletin board system works, when I have some Javadoc stuff to post, I'm not going to actually post all of the HTML files on the Artist Digital website. I'm going to post them because the Artist Digital website lets you post files one at a time. And if you've got a, uh, a Java doc output with 40 files, it becomes kind of tedious. So I'm going to put the whole thing up on my website and then just give you guys a link to it once, once we get to that point. Java doc at the command line, it will give you a list of the arguments. And yeah, it will do that. Yeah, the, by default, if you just tell Java doc to document all the classes in a package, it will put the HTML files into the same directory as the .java files and the .class files, which can be a mess if you subsequently want to do, you know, well, I guess you can copy all the .html, but generally it's easier if you just make their, their own directory for the Java doc files and use the dash D to tell Java doc to put the output there. Um, yeah, you can, uh, there's probably Javadoc on the, a lot of the classes that are used in Javadoc because you can write your own, you can subclass a lot of those things and make your own version of Javadoc. For example, if you want to output stuff as a Windows help file instead of HTML, you can basically override some of the classes in Javadoc and do that. That's going to be on problem set three. Uh, and uh, you're definitely encouraged, particularly as we get later in the month, encouraged in some cases, required in other cases, uh, to put Java doc comments in your source files. I'll make it easier for the staff to figure out what you're trying to do. And um, can I talk about the unique feature of uh, the last problem set? Or, or, and oh, sure. OK. Uh, OK. In, I think it's problem set three, you're going to be working in groups implementing a particular specification that we give you. And then in problem set four, you're going to be, the groups are going to be scrambled up, and each group is going to get somebody else's code, and they're going to have to add more features to it. And your grade is based partly on how good a job you do of adding those features to the pre-existing package, and partly on how good the people who took over your code did on extending it. So if you write, if your solution to problem set three works but is badly designed and underdocumented, you might get an OK grade on problem set three, but you're probably not going to get a good grade on problem set four when the people who are trying to deal with your code throw their hands up. Um, or maybe they. Won't it be their problem then? No, because, <laughs> because, because your, your grade partly depends on how well they do. <laughs> we have our ways. Yeah, th there is uh, an at author, and that in the class, that's a useful thing to, to put in is to put your name so that in case somebody inadvertently drops all the homework, and we can tell who's is who's. And if you, so the website that I mentioned yesterday is basically a Java doc output of essentially 
all the stuff that all the Java classes that Sun puts out, and you can navigate through that and um, get your questions answered. At least you can get your questions answered about how a particular class or method works. Trying to find the class or method that you want can be a little bit harder. Can you search that site? Yes, you can. Anything else on Javadoc? I'm going to mention some uh, specific programming guidelines that David mentioned this morning, but it doesn't hurt to get them pounded into you. One of them is to think first and ask questions. No, sorry. Think first and uh, don't write your program until you understand what you're doing. Um, if you start writing your program and you don't understand what you're doing, then you end up with a bunch of code that doesn't really do anything, and you don't want. And then eventually, you do understand the problem. You don't want to throw out your code, and you try to fix it, and you end up with a mess. Um, if you understand the problem first, then you're less likely to have that happen. And one thing that you can do to help you understand the problem is to try to rewrite the problem in your own words or your own symbols. One of the terms for this is pseudocode, which is to basically assume that the language can do whatever you want and write the program and you know, just use whatever you want, English words, Java symbols, mathematical symbols, whatever. Uh, use calls to methods that you don't really know how you're going to implement them. And you end up with something that, if passed on to the, um, the God language, would actually run and produce the correct result. And once you have that, then you can go through and turn that thing into syntactically correct Java. And you at least have a reasonably chance that not only is it syntactically correct, but it will do something that you want it to do. Except for the fact that I encouraged you to put in calls to methods that you don't know how you would implement them. Well, now you've got a relative, a much smaller well-defined problem. How do we implement this particular method? And you can recursively use the same strategy. Okay, we have this method, and let's think about how to implement it, write some pseudocode, and uh, um, and then implement that in Java as well. One thing which I won't encourage you to do is to try writing a sample implementation of the problem in Scheme. Scheme and Java are sufficiently different languages. <laughs> uh, <laughs> with different ways of doing things, that uh, something that could be far and away the best way of doing something in Scheme, everybody would scratch their heads if you try to do it that way in Java. On the other hand, there might be some really easy way to do it in Java, and you waste all day trying to write your Scheme pseudocode when you didn't have to. And if it's, if it's problem number one in a problem set, and you're spending two hours trying to write Scheme pseudocode, Probably the reason it's hard is that it's easy in Java and hard in Scheme. And the last thing is to write in small chunks and test often. So, for example, you've written this uh, top-level thing that has calls to a bunch of methods that you don't know how you would implement. You can implement, you can put in dummy methods, either that just print out a message that says, we called this method with such and such arguments, and then make up a return value and return it. So then you can actually run your main method, get some output, and check that it's actually calling the things that you want to call in the right order and with the right arguments. Another thing you can do that some people like and some people don't like is... Um, doing uh, at least some parts of the thing bottom up. You say, well, I know I'm going to need a method that does such and such. 
So you write, the, and, and you know how to do it. So you write it, you test it, and it works. And now that might, uh, that may make the overall problem a little less daunting, because at least you know how to do, not only do you know how to do it, you've already implemented part of it. And so when you get to this point where you're calling the method that you don't know how to do it, well, you actually do know how to do it, and you did it, and you can put that call in. And, um, you need to be careful about doing that, that you don't end up implementing things that aren't really the right way to do it, because you thought you were going to need it, and it would have really been better to do it a different way. But uh, sometimes if you're really stuck on a problem, it can be helpful just to give you a foothold, and you have, okay, I have this, and it works. And uh, at least psychologically, that can be helpful. Any questions about any of the things that I've gone over or that David went over so far today? Okay. Uh, that means I get to teach you new stuff. I have a question that we haven't gone over. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot that case. Yes. <laughs> I just wonder, writing these programs, if there's any suggestions for style, like making out variable names. Uh, the most important thing is to be consistent so that if somebody is reading your code and they see a curly brace in one place, then they know they're going to see the matching curly brace somewhere else. Uh, you, know, and, you know, they know where to look for the matching uh, closed brace. And also to put a comment on the closed brace if it's far away from the open brace. Uh, look, at look at examples that other people have written. Pick a style that works for you. Generally, method names tend to be verbs or verbs with other words coming after them and because they're, they're telling the computer to do something. Execute, get something, uh, change something, find something. Uh, whereas class names and property names are going to tend to be nouns. They represent things that exist, even if only in your head or the computer's head. But in some sense, they represent things that exist. So they tend to be nouns, possibly nouns with modifying words. Um, and to indent your code, uh, some editors, I'm not sure what you're using or how it's configured, but some editors will support certain coding styles. If you've got one line that's indented a certain amount and you hit enter, then it'll automatically indent the next line the same amount. And then if you're lucky, you put in a closed brace and it'll undent that to match the open brace. Uh, and how much you indent it, it's not a big deal as long as you indent it some and you're consistent so that it's easy to tell what things are at the same level as other things. Begin with capital letters. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I, I seem to remember getting burned putting something in with a small letter. It was supposed to be a capital letter, and I don't remember what it was. Uh, but generally, that's a good guess, is that uh, all of the words other than the first one start with capital letters. And the first one starts with a cap, the first word starts with a capital letter if it's a class name or an interface name, and it starts with a lowercase letter otherwise. Uh, and things that are meant to be constant, defined constants, like our operators in the opcode example tend to be all caps. Right. If there are a bunch of related things, try to use a consistent style in naming them so that it's clear, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z rather than uh, A, S, and X or something like that. You know, if they're just, ran, you know, a few random doubles or something like that. Unlike Fortran, you don't, for those of you who remember Fortran, uh, you're not required to use particular letters, but there's probably some X Fortran programmers uh, and in fact, if you look at examples um, that talk about integers, the integers tend to be called uh, letter, you know, if it's just a random integer that's used in a for loop or something like that, they tend to be from I to N because that's what Fortran made you do. 
a uh, little historical note there. Um, was that helpful? And uh, put comments on so that uh, if your code wasn't as clear as you thought it was, then other people will be able to figure out what you were doing. Doesn't do with those slash, slash comments. No, it doesn't do anything with slash. Slash slash comments are intended for the person who's reading your code trying to figure out what it's doing. Which could be you five years down the road when somebody says, remember that thing you wrote? We want you to add some features to it. No, I don't remember that thing I wrote. <laughs> OK. Uh, so now I get to do some new stuff, which is inner classes. And considering the reception my Java doc comment earlier got, I'm not going to say anything about what an inner class is that you might think is funny because you probably won't. <laughs> yeah, but at least most of you aren't drunk. <laughs> um, uh, keep in mind that all is a is a sub something of, of some. Um, OK, uh, just as variables can have different scopes, a variable can be can have scope within a method, or a variable can have scope within a class, a class can also have scope. And the scope is different from the, uh, ac the security access, you know, those things that start with P. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's a general word for those three things that start with P, but uh, that's different from scope. <laughs> pu pu sorry, public, protected, and private. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, so regardless of whether something is public, private, or protected, it can have different scope. Scope means where the compiler will uh, syntactically recognize it as existing. If you, ha if you try to refer to a, something that's out of scope, the compiler will give you an error saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. If you try to access something that's private that you don't have access to, it will know that it's there and it'll give you a different message telling you that you're trying to access something that's private rather than that it doesn't exist. So just as we have this distinction with variables, we also have this distinction with classes. Most classes have um, scope of your whole program, that anywhere, anywhere within your package, you can refer to a class and its methods and its objects. And you just give the name of the class. You can also have classes that are within other classes. So you write, you have the open brace that starts a class, and you define the methods on the class, and you define the um, instance variables, the properties on the class. Uh, and you, also def you can also define inner classes on the class. That's another way on style, by the way, that different people do differently, but you should try to be consistent. Some people always put the properties of a class at the beginning and then the methods. Some people always put the methods first and then the properties. Are you calling properties, do you mean data? Properties, di yeah, data, var variables, in instance variables, whatever, class variables. Um, you can do it either way. Just try to be consistent so that the person who's looking at your code knows where to find it. Uh, it's suggested that you put the public stuff at the beginning so that if somebody's looking at your code to try to figure out what's important to them, they're probably going to be more interested in the public stuff that they can actually get at than in the implementation details that might be lower down. Uh, you should probably also be consistent about where you put your constructors, and they tend to be at the beginning. So one of the other things that you throw in there inside the braces that encompass an entire class 
is you can have another class definition. And you might wonder, why would you do this? Why would you just have the thing be its own class? There are a few reasons for that, and I have three examples, two of which I like and one of which I'll apologize for. I couldn't come up with anything better. Uh, the first example is if you have something that really doesn't make any sense outside the context of the class. For example, going back to our file system package, we have, for each file, we have a list of um, places on the disk where you can actually find the data for that file. It starts at, you have 100 blocks starting at block number 3,000, and then another 15 blocks starting at block number 2,000, and so on. So for, we have a list that says, start at this block number and take that many blocks. And you could implement this with two arrays. You would have one array that says starting block number and another array that's the same size that says number of blocks. And it would work, except that you have to remember every time you do something, uh, insert or delete things into this list, that you have to do it to both of them. And there's no obvious connection between them. So you might say, OK, these things are related. We're going to make an object that's a um, bunch of blocks. And it's not necessarily going to have any methods on it. It'll have two properties. One is starting block number, and the other is number of blocks. And then in the file object, we'll define a um, bunch of blocks Um, so we'll define, an, we'll define this array that has the data type bunch of blocks. And then lower down, we have, oops, I'm not ready for a brace yet. Uh, we'll have class bunch of blocks. int starting block and int yeah. I thought about calling this block count, but this is a stylish. I decided I'd rather have them both end with block. Might make it a little bit easier. Everything that has to do with blocks ends with the word block rather than has it having it at some random place in the name. So we have this class, and we use it in the file object. Now, we really aren't going to ever use it anywhere else. There's, um, there's no reason for anybody else to know how we implemented the storage scheme for file. And quite possibly, we would have some subclass of file that implements the storage completely different way and doesn't use this class. Uh, maybe it's the uh, defragmented file where everything is in one, um, one contiguous block, uh, or, or who knows. So this class makes sense only in the context of the file class. So up here we have file, class file, and we have lots of stuff. And included in this lots of stuff, we have the definition of the class bunch of blocks. And lo and behold, somebody left a brace on the board for me. Um, so you can refer to this class from within file just as you could refer to any other class. But if you had some other class that attempted to refer to a bunch of blocks, then the compiler would tell you that it didn't know 
that there was such a class as bunch of blocks. And subclasses get access to it, or no? You could make a subclass of bunch of blocks if you wanted to. But if you had like text file oh. extends file, uh, okay. To use okay. Um, it would it would be in scope of the subclasses. Whether it's actually accessible depends on what you put out here. Uh, so if you put that it was private, then subclasses wouldn't get access to it. If you put that it was protected, then they would get access to it. And you could also put that it was public, which would mean that anybody could get access to it. Um, so if you wanted, if you changed your mind and you decide that you did want the outside world to have access to it, then you can make it public. And in that case, um, what, uh, why don't we do a guessing game here? Anybody want to try to guess how something outside of class file would create a new bunch of blocks. Any guesses? So we're, we're, we're somewhere else. We're, we're writing some code, and we're not inside the file class, but we still want to refer to the uh, class bunch of blocks. Yeah, file, file dot bunch of blocks. So you can you could have new. Assuming that you have access to it. Not if it's a um, inner class. It, it can't be in a separate file. Um, if it's how does it tell the difference between that and package file of a bunch of blocks? Um, my guess is that it gets lucky, but uh, <laughs> um, well, I, you probably can't have a class and my guess is you can't have a class in a package with the same name because uh, they're at the same namespace level and it would be a conflict. So I'm, I'm sorry. By this, do you mean that? Yeah. That's not creating. That's creating an um, an instance. Right. But, right. But the instance doesn't have the doesn't have access to the other public things that are in the class file. Um. Going to get weird. Because this this class would have access to private things inside an instance right. of file. Right. But when you do this, there is no instance of file. Um, okay, Here, uh, here's the answer to both questions. Um, uh, you don't say file that bunch of blocks. You actually give it an instance um, of the class file, and now um, um, so now it's going to be part of whichever object you put before the period. And each bunch of, if you created multiple ones, they would all refer to the same instance of file. If you kept saying, you know, if you put a for loop, new new some file that bunch of blocks. There's one thing you said which uh, is an important point that I just want to repeat, is that this class doesn't have any methods. It's just used as a structure to uh, keep data together that belongs together. If we did start putting methods on it, um, for example, if we had the constructor for this automatically add itself to that array, um, then uh, we have two things. One is that we can access the private, um, let's put private up here. Let's just 
So even though this is private, because this class is part, uh, private means you can't be accessed by anything outside the class. This is within the class, and so it can access it. Um, and it doesn't need to say anything dot blocks. It, if it just says blocks, then it's referring to the blocks array in its parent object. People get that? Um, okay, uh, let's say we have a method down here, which I'm going to write. So this, this method is in uh, class Bob. We have Bob, which means it's a constructor. Uh, Okay, we have a constructor for a bunch of blocks. And it's a constructor that gets an int passed into it. So it calls super because it has to. What is the super? What class is super referring to? Object. Since, since class Bob doesn't extend anything, it's, uh, it's super is object. So do you have to do that? I mean, we don't do that for. You, you always have to have a call to super and a constructor. Don't. Don't. Only if you're explicitly okay. inheriting. Okay. I don't. But I don't think if you just define a class, you need to call super to call. Okay. Object. Okay. So it's only true if you're. Okay. Sorry about that. I've probably done that in places where I didn't have to because I was tired of getting error messages and I didn't. It was early on and I hadn't. Uh, figured out that pattern yet. OK, thank you. Uh, if we did say super, then it would refer to object, but we don't need to. I think it calls the, the constructor on object automatically. So we say blocks of position equals this. So this refers to the new bunch of blocks that we just created, and blocks refers to this array in the containing object. So we had up here file some file. Uh, well, I'm going to get an error now because um, this is a j because it's an integer. Um, so we're calling this constructor and we're passing in a position, and we're setting into some files, blocks array, um, us. So it, it automatically refers to the, um, the properties within the containing class just as a method that was part of the containing, directly part of the containing class automatically refers to the, uh, the properties on the containing class. Yeah. Basic question. I don't know Good. What this is going to show, but uh, why not just do it as a method if it's just a, like a local class and nobody else needs access? To well, it, why wouldn't you just make it a method and somehow try to associate data with the method? So it right. Th this methods do things. This isn't doing anything. It's just um, it's just oh. data. At, at least at this point, until, until I brought um, the uh, constructor into play. Um, 
because we have an array, a, a list of pairs of starting block and number of blocks. And each starting block, they're not just two arrays that happen to have the same number of elements. Um, each starting block is closely paired with a number of blocks. And so by creating this class, we're, we're illustrating that we basically have a list of block, a list of bunches of blocks. Um, and each bunch of blocks has one of these. Has has one of each of these, right? Yeah. There, there are other contexts where you might have a class like this that was not an inner class, such as if you had a class of playing cards, where it didn't have any methods, but it had two properties. One is which suit is it, and one is what's the denomination. Um, and so this, and because you want to keep them together, it doesn't make sense, you know, if you're playing poker, you know, well, I've got the deuce of spades and the four of clubs and a heart, you know, well, which heart is it? You know, it doesn't, you, if you've got the card there, it's a specific heart, and it doesn't make sense to have, have one without the other, and here it doesn't make sense to have one without the other, so we combine them together in this class. And uh, we could do this whole thing with a uh, an outer class, a class that was not internal to file. But then we have a problem that we we couldn't do this in the constructor because the constructor is modifying blocks, which is private. So we'd have to put another method on file to do that, and um, we'd have to specify. You know, which blocks and pass in who the parent is and it get all messy. Um, whereas this is pretty simple. You automatically get who the parent is and you automatically get access to the private variables. Just going to mention one other syntactical thing. Uh, which is, I'm not going to do anything with it, but if your code on a method on an inner class needs to refer to the file that it's in, then you would use file.this. Just as you use this to refer to yourself, you can use parent class.this to refer to um, the containing, the, the current instance of the containing class. Um, that could be useful, for example, if, you want, if you're trying to call a method somewhere else far away and you need to pass in the reference to the file that you're part of, then you would use file.this. How are we doing on, on this? Let me give one other example of an inner class. This is my bad example, so don't ask any hard questions about the example. If you want to ask hard questions about the concepts, that's fine, but don't ask hard questions about the example because it'll <laughs> fall apart. Um, suppose you have some big, hairy class that's probably too big anyway, um, uh, like an elevator system. And it's got a million uh, private variables to keep track of the state of all the elevators. And you've got some other classes dealing with the buttons on the elevators and the buttons on the floors to call the elevators and the display for the uh, firefighters out by the front door. And because you didn't really design this the right way, everything needs to access the private variables on this class, then you can you might end up with uh, some inner classes um, that you wrote for the purpose of being able to access and manipulate the private variables. That's probably not the right way to do this, but it is a way. 
and uh, there probably is a good example of <coughs> why you would create an inner class for the purpose, of, for the primarily for the purpose of accessing the private variables on a containing class. I just don't know offhand what is a good example. Okay. Uh, one other thing I should mention about ordinary inner classes. You know that for every class, you get a class.class, .class, you know, like a file.class .file, .class file and a file system.class file, .class file etc., in your directory when you compile it. You don't get a bunch of blocks.class .class file. Um, for one thing, it would be difficult for the compiler to find it because it's associated with file. And for another thing, you might have two different classes that both have inner classes called bunch of blocks. Since the scope is entirely within the class, every class can have one. Um, and in some cases, that might even be a good idea. Um, so what it does is it calls the file file dollar sign bunch of blocks dot class, which is nice because if you get a list, they appear near each other alphabetically, which is just convenient if you need that kind of information. And it guarantee it it enables the compiler and the runtime to find it, and it guarantees that you don't run into conflicts when two different classes implement the same inner class. Sorry, what was the name, what was the dollar sign doing? The dollar sign indicates that that file represents an inner class. Okay. Um, it might have been file dot block, file dot bunch of blocks dot class, um, because that's the way you refer to it, but having the multiple dots confuses some file systems and some programs. Uh, so a dollar sign is used instead. But in reality, we would probably have an instance of file, so wouldn't it be like... This is just has to do with how the class, the compiled class definition is stored in your directory. It doesn't have anything to do with um, how you refer to it syntactically. It could have just put it as part of the file class, but it didn't. One of the reasons for not putting it as part of the file class is that one of the design goals is to um, have just-in-time loading of class definitions. So if you have a bunch of class definitions that you never actually use, then um, then the runtime won't spend a lot of time loading them. So if you have uh, this class is going to get used all the time, but you might have some other in a class that uh, doesn't get used on a particular day, and so it doesn't need to get loaded in. Whereas if it were part of file.class, then it would need to get loaded in every time file did. I get the feeling you don't use these inner classes very much. Well, there's another case that I'm about to come up with where they get used a lot. Uh, and but you have to understand these examples before you get to understand the other example. Uh, so let's make sure. Is, are there any other questions about this example? One of the things that's a pain in Java that you're going to learn about being a pain is uh, reading files and getting a line at a time and processing it. And what would be nice is if somebody would give you a method that you could say something like, um, uh, let's suppose we have a adding machine program. And the way it works is you have a bunch of lines and each line has a number on it, and you want to add up the numbers. So we have int 
sum. Let me call this method process file file name uh, comma So what you want to be able to do is um, call this method process file, pass it the file name, and tell it what you want it to do. And let it deal with all the messy stuff of opening the file, making sure the file is really there, checking for exceptions as it reads lines, line by line and all that stuff. And then you tell it what to do. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to work this way. Um, and I'll try to actually do this at the time um, that you uh, that you call process file, rather than somehow magically having process file know that this is what you want to do. In some languages, you get to do this and have process file evaluate um, that thing. Um, based on the text. That doesn't work in Java. Among other things, how is it going to know which sum it's supposed to increment? So we can do this in a couple steps. We have a class up here. And we're going to write an inner class. Um, Now it's probably going to be an interface. Um, oh. Class process line implements line processor. Uh, yes, another case of an interface. It's a good thing we learned about interfaces already because we're using it. Um, so class process line implements line processor. And it has a method um, public void do it of string line. And here we put the code that we had before. Sum plus equals integer dot parsint of line um, dot integer value. Because otherwise, you get the this. Uh, integer dot parsint of line is a static method. All, all of the, uh, do you know about the wrapper classes for the basic types? Um, okay. All of the, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but all of the uh, basic numerical classes, uh, integer, double, um, et cetera, you can't use them as objects. They don't have any methods. Um, but sometimes you want to have them as objects, for example, to use the comparable interface. You can't, um, a number can't implement the comparable interface because it's not an object, so it doesn't have any methods. So for all of the basic types, which all start with lowercase letters, there's an uppercase version, which is a class, and it has a bunch of useful Things and they all have, for example, class dot parse, um, where you give it a string and it returns an object of the appropriate type. Um, 
so we have to, and, um, in order to actually change it from an integer uh, class, an integer object, into an integer that we can add, we call the integer value method on. So first we call the parseInt method, which is a static method, and gives us back an integer object, and then we call integer value on that integer object to give us back the actual number as an integer, and then we can add it to sum. Um, <laughs> basically, you put them in the order that they get done. So we have the first thing we want to do is parse out an integer from the line. So we have integer dot parse int of line, and that gives us an integer object. Now that we have the integer object, we can call a method on it. Why do we need the integer before the parse int? Because this is parse int is a method on a static method on class integer. So if we didn't put integer dot, it wouldn't know which parse int we were talking about. Okay, so here we have a um, a class. There's another brace down here. We have a class that has a method, do it, which takes the line that was magically read and adds its value to sum. And since it's an inner class of whatever we've got here, this is some class, um, let's write class. Um, since it's an inner class, it knows which sum needs to be incremented. Now, what you might like to write is file name, comma, process line. But that would be too easy. And besides, you can't pass classes to methods. The only things you can pass to methods are basic types and objects. You can't pass classes. You can't pass methods or any of the other things like that. You can only pass um, objects and, and basic types. <coughs> so what we have here is That's okay. I'll get. I'll get to that. You do. It, it needs to exist, but it doesn't exist here. Um, so what this is going to do is create a new object of class process line, which implements line processor, and pass that along with the file name to process file. Now over here. We have um, interface line processor, public void um, do it of string line. And then we have, oh, there's, um, there's probably, depending on where this is, there might be some class name out here. There might not be. It depends whether it's part of the same class. Um, but let's pretend it's part of the same class so that we don't need to worry about it. Um, and now we have process file of string file name. line processor LP. And um, 
So here is where Dewitt gets called from. Uh, so let's just look at this side first, and then we'll look at that side and see how they work together and why this compiles okay. We're defining LP as a line processor. Since it's a line processor, we know that it has a Dewitt method, which means that down here we can say LP.Dewitt and pass it a string. So we've got a method. We pass in a file name and a line processor. And while string line equals magically get line, um, we call do it on the line processor. So whatever the line processor happens to do in its do it method, we're going to do that for every line. So when we put these things together, what happens is we call process file, passing it the file name and an object of this inner class, and it goes through and magically gets lines, puts the value into line, calls do it on LP, which LP is an object of this class. It gets the line, it turns it into an integer, and it adds it to sum. And uh, this, this script here doesn't have to worry about any of the grody details of <coughs> how you read a file or how you loop through all the lines in the file. Amazingly enough, this thing doesn't have to worry about it either. Um, but eventually, somebody's going to have to write magically get line. Um, but it's not going to be today. Uh, so now we have a structure where any time we want to uh, read through a file and process the lines one by one, we can call process file, pass in um, a file name and an object in a class. We might have a second class. Uh, we might decide um, that process line is the wrong name for this class and call it add line because it reads it reads through the um, the lines and adds them to some. And we might write some other uh, some other thing called echo line, which just takes a line and writes it back out to system with system.out.println. And we might have another one that multiplies them together and another one that does something else. And, they all, and you, can, you can give them whatever name you want. You just have to make sure you say implements line processor so that this call to process file will compile. This is essentially a way to pass a method in. You're not really passing the method. You're passing the object. And the important distinction about the fact that you're passing an object is that since it's an object of this inner class, it has access to the private variables because probably what you want this thing to do is to modify some of your own private variables as it It sits inside of some, some script, uh, wherever you need it done. But it doesn't sit right where it's sitting right now, which is uh, yeah. one of the defining methods of the um, Right. Um. Okay. Now, it's important that do it be marked as public uh, because, well, in this case, process file is in the same class. In most cases, you're going to have some package that you're using that's going to have a callback. This is called a callback. We're sending something out, and it's calling us back. Um, most of the time, you're going to have some package that somebody else wrote that's going to be implementing the callbacks, and so they're going to be calling it from who knows where. And so it needs to be it needs to be public so that it can get called from out there. So this is something you'd use all the time. This this general strategy is something that uh, that you use a lot. And it uh, probably gets used a lot more 
Um, there, there are specific places where you have to do this when you start learning about graphical user interfaces. Um, you have to use callbacks um, in order to say, here's, here's a method I want you to call when somebody presses this button. And the, the way the interface is written, that's the way you have to do it. But because it's so clean to do it this way, you may find yourselves doing stuff like this, even when it's just all your own code. Um, and uh, this particular example is something that uh, I'm using in my example that you're going to see Monday uh, because it was a lot nicer than doing it the other way. You get the implementation of how you read a file off someplace where it can be reused and where it doesn't clutter up somebody trying to read this script. So it's okay, we're going to process this file and we're going to call a method on that object. Now, if you're going to be doing this a lot, you might find it useful to have an object sitting around of this type, but you probably wouldn't. Uh, on the contrary, in most cases, you're going to go in the opposite direction. Uh, does anybody need this part? Okay. You can write sum equals a plus b of math dot sign of sum. But unless you're going to use sum again, there's, uh, I can say double. Unless you're going to use it again, there's no particularly great reason to make up this variable. Sometimes if you have a really big expression, you want to do something like that. It can be, uh, you know, if this is really long, you might want to leave it in a variable. It makes debugging a lot easier if you can just throw in a print line here that says, okay, tell me what the, that value is because things aren't working right and we want to find out what that value is before we continue processing. Um, where if, whereas it's, it's something simple, you're more likely to just write math dot sign of a plus b. And it works out exactly the same, except you don't have this additional step of assigning it to an intermediate value. You, uh, so we get rid of one variable, one, one more name to remember and get confused by. So you can do the same thing with inner classes. Uh, if you have a really big class and this thing is sitting in a really big method, then you're reading through the code and it says process file, file name, new add line. Well, where is add line? What does it do? Uh, and it's one more name to keep track of. So what we can say instead is So uh, we say process file, file name, and then just as here we say, oops, left out the parentheses. New always has parentheses. Um, so rather than making up a name for this class, we just put the class here as part of the new. And it works exactly the same way. You just have to remember that what you say here is new, the name of the interface. Uh, so there's, there's not a class. You never use the keyword class 
or extends or implements. You just say new and the name of the interface. And you put an open brace just as you would with any other class, a closed brace at the end, the methods in between, anything else you need to support it in between, closed brace to close the definition of the class, the parenthesis, right parenthesis to close the call, and the semicolon. And this will work exactly the same way that this example did. But if you're reading the code, you'll be able to immediately see process file. Okay, it's adding uh, the contents of the line to the variable sum. Some way, sometimes it might be easier to do it this way, um, but most of the time people end up doing it this way. If you have so much code that's going to get in the way of reading, uh, reading the calling method, then you might do it this way with a named inner class. I should mention, by the way, that a inner class in this context could have multiple methods. You might have another method that gets called when it reaches the end of the file or something like that. Um, and that me other method would be defined in the interface, and you'd put it in here, either in here or in here, and the process file would call it when it needed to. This is, so this is called an anonymous inner class. It's an inner class that doesn't have a name. And uh, we need to actually have some name up here so I can um, class outer. So this is going to compile down to a file called outer dollar one dot class. And if you have lots of inner classes and there's lots of anonymous inner classes, you get outer dot one, outer dot two, outer sorry, outer dollar two. That's Line processor is an interface, but this thing is a anonymous class that implements the interface. And Java lets you leave out a bunch of those words. You, you don't, you, conceptually, it's a, this says new anonymous class implements line processor. Shall we stop for today? <laughs> <laughs>